Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar hosted by the As I Am organization, Ireland's national autism charity. My name is Joe Little. I'm a journalist, and I have had an interest in disability and autism issues for over three decades. The seminar, the webinar, I should say, has been organized at very short notice in response to last Thursday's RT Investigates revelations that the Department of Health has been secretly using information from private medical consultations to build and maintain dossiers or files on dozens of children with autism who had sued the state to get appropriate educational supports. Apart from myself, two speakers will address the webinar. Firstly, Fiona Ferris, who's Deputy Chief Executive Officer of As I Am, and she joins us from Cork. Fiona joined As I Am in 2017 as the early years specialist with a desire, as she put it, to contribute her own experiences of being autistic and of being the mother of a child on the spectrum so as to help others understand life from an autistic perspective. In her talks, Fiona aims to give practical, relatable knowledge and strategies to assist others in supporting the autistic community to meet their own individual potential and fully participate in their community. Welcome, Fiona. And here in Dublin, we're joined by Gareth Noble, a solicitor recognised as one of Ireland's leading litigators in the area of children with disabilities. Gareth has extensive experience in representing families seeking educational services for such children and an early assessment of their needs and of the services required to meet them. For the past 13 years, he has been a partner in Kelleher O'Doherty Solicitors. You're also welcome, Gareth. We'll be recording both of your contributions, but we'll cease to record when we start to discuss the questions, which we hope will come in via the Q&A function on the Zoom screen. Uh, our format this evening will begin with a summary of some of the main points in last Thursday's RT Investigates report. We'll then hear from Fiona about As I Am's meeting with a government minister this afternoon and several other matters relating to the broadcast. Then we'll hear from Gareth. And in a little over half an hour from now, the As I Am backroom team should have harvested plenty of questions from the Q&A box on your Zoom screens. It's important that you type in your questions as they occur to you and our moderators will beaver away at ensuring that all points covered by those questions can be put by me to Fiona and Gareth. We should have a little more than half an hour of questions and answers, and we hope to wrap up around a quarter past eight. That's in a little over, an, uh, a little more than an hour from now. And uh, at the end, I'll be giving you the email address of As I Am. If you feel your question hasn't been answered, and you, you want to pursue it, you can email uh, the As I Am organization, their, uh, their uh, corporate email address and uh, repeat the question to As I Am. And on this very busy week, uh, Friday sees the marking of World Autism Day, uh, they'll do their very best uh, given their limited resources to get back to you to an answer to, with an answer to your question. Firstly, then, let me try to summarize the main points of Thursday's program, which, of course, many of you will have seen by now. It featured detailed statements by Shane Kaur, a civil servant in the Department of Health, on how he discovered that sensitive confidential medical and educational information had been gathered by the department about the children and their family members. For the benefit of those who have been too busy to retain the essential elements of the broadcast, I'll summarize and remind you of some of them. The whistleblower, Mr. Kaur, said, the reports the department gathered included details of specialist service provision and documented the well-being and mindset of parents as they coped with the needs of their child. RT's Connor Ryan reported that families were unaware that what they disclosed to medical staff in order to get treatment and support for their child was being passed on to the department. In one instance, he said evidence suggested 
that a detailed report was sent to the department following a psychiatric consultation with a child. Another case involved the sharing of a video of a child in a distressed state. There were also updates from local care, community mental health and support services to the department on individual cases and on individual families. The reports also record details such as marital breakdowns among parents and addictions in the homes of some of the children concerned. The programme said the information was shared and gathered with the help of the HSE and the Department of Education with the goal of aiding the Department of Health with what RTE called a background legal strategy, which among other things would allow it to determine when would be a good time to approach parents to settle or withdraw their cases. The programme described template letters which were circulated to health and education services in which the Department of Health explicitly instructed that the families concerned should not be told the sensitive information was being gathered about them. Finally, the whistleblower said he had seen departmental reports of this controversial kind on four dozen dormant legal cases involving children with autism. For its part, the Department of Health in a statement said the information sharing discovered by RT Investigates was what it called normal practice in circumstances where different state bodies shared information when they were involved in litigation jointly. It said it had commissioned an expert senior counsel, that's a senior barrister, to review the practice and that nothing arising from that review caused the department to change its approach. The department further said that under data protection legislation, it was entitled to share and store information for the purposes of getting legal advice or to defend court proceedings. As I am called for a thorough independent investigation to find out who is responsible for initiating inquiries, which resulted in medical doctors and other professionals, such as social workers, updating the state on confidential consultations with the vulnerable people concerned. As I said earlier, as I am's Deputy CEO Fiona Ferris, who joins us from Cork this evening, will now pick up the story, including that she, I hope, tell us about uh, the As I Am meeting this afternoon with uh, Minister of State Anne Rabbit, who is responsible for the disability area in government. Fiona. Thanks so much, Joe. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for taking the time to attend tonight. We understand, of course, that this was arranged at short notice as a direct response to what we learned last Thursday evening. It really is of crucial importance at this time that we come together and work together as a community to get answers to the questions that we might have, but also support each other through our own experiences and feelings arising from the primetime episode. So since the story broke last Thursday night, in As I Am, we've been determined to act quickly. So we, we set our concerns out quite broadly in the media First thing on Friday morning, we moved to engage with the government and the opposition. We scheduled this webinar this evening to give people the space to learn about their rights and to ask the questions that they need to be answered. And we also met with the Minister of State for Disability, Anne Rabbit, today, and we'll be meeting with Sinn Féin on Thursday with further meetings to be scheduled in the coming days. We know and understand it is a stressful and worrying time for everyone in our community. And we hope tonight that people can begin to get answers to their questions, or at least know what to consider next. We want to provide information that will, where appropriate, reassure or, or help you to decide if and when further action is required. Tonight isn't only about information, it's about listening. So your questions will directly inform our advocacy and we will use the questions raised tonight as a basis for our further engagement with government, Oireachtas members and the Oireachtas Committee on Health. For us, while this is about the law and the ignoring of public policy, it goes much deeper than that. 
It's about a state leaving behind its autism community, its most vulnerable members at an incredibly difficult time in their lives and actively seeking to frustrate rights. It's also about the culture of the government in terms of how it interacts with our families when they need the most support. Today, we met with Minister Rabbit and made a number of requests. First, we requested that all families who are affected be urgently contacted, be appropriately supported and not require any recourse to the courts for the answers or next steps that they need or face any legal obstacles to accessing their information. We ask that those who have taken litigation in the past but who are not affected to also be written to, to that effect. We have also asked that a dedicated information point or an email address be established for those who are not directly impacted but now have concerns. We stated our very clear position that an independent external investigation is required, covering all departments involved with a broad remit to encompass the legal and ethical factors at play and to make recommendations to ensure that this issue never arises again and that there's a change of culture towards how our community members are viewed in the departments concerned. We highlighted the root cause, which is underinvestment and a lack of respect for families. Trust and, inv and investment is urgently required. The minister informed us that they propose to publish the senior, senior council report and that up to 400 cases may be involved. Possibly less, but no more than that. It was agreed that As I Am would follow up after tonight's webinar with further detailed questions and that the, the minister would revert with the relevant responses. As I Am will not cease to advocate for the relevant action needed. Tonight is just one action we are undertaking to address your concerns and will continue to lobby all stakeholders for an independent inquiry, which is so urgently needed. Any questions, as Joe mentioned, that we do not get to tonight, please get in touch. There are lots of limitations on an event of this nature with so many participants, but we really hope that it will be a useful start. We are here to work with and to support the community. It is awful that our forthcoming month of events to mark World Autism Month, what should be a celebration, has been dampened by this scandal, but it highlights that more than ever, there's a need for true understanding and acceptance of autism. Together, we need to work to make this a turning point, and together, we need to ensure that this will not happen again. Thank you. Fiona. Uh, Fiona Ferris, Deputy CEO of As I Am. As I mentioned earlier, we now turn to Gareth Noble, who is a very experienced solicitor in the area of children's rights and disability, and specifically in the educational uh, provision area, uh, where he has litigated on behalf of families who want to get appropriate provision for their children who have autism. Gareth, would you like to bring us through the main questions which you think are arising now in light of the primetime investigates of the, sorry, the RT investigates program last Thursday evening? Thank you, Joe, and good, good evening, everybody. Um, it seems incredible that we have to spend a nice sunny evening uh, debating something and discussing something that should never have arisen in the first place. And that's the first observation uh, that I would certainly uh, make. Can I also firstly thank you, Joe, um, uh, in agreeing at short notice to moderate tonight's event? Can I, thank, can I also thank As I Am and a number of other advocacy and representative organisations on behalf of parents and family who have very quickly uh, identified the very key issues uh, that are of concern to those uh, who represent them. And I note also that uh, the Ombudsman for Children uh, the, uh, uh, and other organisations, including the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, have also wrote in uh, with their particular perspectives also. What arose last week in the primetime programme is a legal issue. It's also a political issue and it is also a social justice issue. And we cannot divorce 
each of those particular elements um, and say that it is one and not the other. Uh, this cuts across a range of different areas. And it should be, first of all, highlighted that whilst on the face of it and to the wider general public, this might seem unfair and startling. I think for an awful lot of parents who have been at the cutting edge and at the front line in terms of protecting and vindicating the rights, particularly of their children, this disclosure will come neither as a shock nor as a surprise. Uh, because uh, the, Ireland is a cold place at the moment uh, for children and their families who are seeking to vindicate even the most basic of rights. And it's time uh, that those who uh, uh, are making our decisions are called out on those things uh, and that there is a much greater emphasis on open and transparent governance and decision making. In a number of range of laws in our country, particularly after the children's rights referendum in 2012, we move towards a situation where we have increased emphasis on the paramount consideration being the welfare of the child. That's reflected in child protection law now uh, through the Child and Family Agency and TUSLA. That is reflected in many of our uh, elements in terms of private family law. Uh, and it is also reflected in the constitutional amendment itself, which said that where there are proceedings brought by the state or which involve the state, the paramount consideration is the welfare of the child. Allied to that is the fact that when we come to looking at education, education is a constitutionally protected the right. The constitution is, uh, is a contract between the state and its citizen, and it sets out what the role of the state is. The role of the state is to provide for an education. And what is an education? An education must be looking at what is in the child's best interests, what meets their needs, how can they access the curriculum, uh, and what additional supports do they need? The Epson Act of 2004 enshrines the principle that uh, children should be educated in a learning environment with the right and appropriate supports. That should be read also in line with the Disability Act of 2005, which makes it very clear about how a child's needs should be assessed. Trust, before I talk about each of those elements, what I'm going to talk about is something that has really come up time and time again over the last number of days, and that is the word trust. We are in a situation now where trust is trust in a system that is already in short supply has been further compromised by the revelations that medical professionals and schools surreptitiously forward copies of reports on children and their families without their knowledge and consent. They did so on foot of request by government departments uh, engaged in litigation. And whilst there are separate issues to be pursued in respect of the lawfulness of that approach by the professionals involved, it, it's also more than worrying that the first reaction, the first response of the Department of Health was to defend the approach which was taken. It doesn't augur well for future confidence uh, that this policy pursued is regarded in that open letter by a very senior official within the Department of Health that this is to be considered as normal and acceptable practice. It is far from it. So the Taoiseach sentiments in the aftermath of the programme that the priority must always be the interests of children and that efforts would be made to investigate, review uh, and address properly the disclosures is the proper starting point. At this point, from parents that I've been speaking to over the last number of days, nothing less than full cooperation, full openness, full collaboration from all of the departments of government involved uh, will suffice. And one of the things that uh, I would like to, uh, one of the points that I'd like to uh, highlight in particular from a legal perspective is that it should not be up to the families involved to further litigate matters in order to establish the truth of what had occurred in their own individual cases. And I'd respectfully say that it is in fact going to be much more expensive for the state if they are in a position where they are going to have to put parents in a position to litigate 
to establish whether or not they were affected or not. And that is why it is critical, for example, uh, that what as I am and others have called for is that those families who were involved in this litigation, whether it's 40 cases or 400 cases, that they are contacted through their solicitors on record to be told whether or not, and I say whether or not, because I think that everybody should be contacted to be told, yes, uh, this policy uh, endorsed by the department uh, involved you or no, it did not. And what I also worry about, uh, and this is a matter for an independent external inquiry, is that if it is considered by the department that there is nothing to see here and that there is nothing wrong, that gives me great worry because implied within that is that this is a practice which continues. And it is therefore very important going forward that governments, government departments, uh, and those at the very senior level of government uh, stand aside from this policy and make it very clear that going forward, uh, this policy will, will not be pursued. Um, the position in relation to um, the uh, legal advice which may have been relied upon, that will always, of course, have to be a part of any external inquiry. But also what's really important is that the terms of reference for that uh, legal advice should also be published because we do not want to have to look at a, at a senior counsel. And I'm, I've been involved in lots of senior counsel's advices. Uh, and it would be a gap to simply publish the legal advice without what was requested of that legal advisor in the first place. And I welcome also Minister Rabbit's, Rabbit's commitment to looking to uh, ensuring that that legal advice is, uh, is published. Can I say also that there has been great emphasis on whether or not the sharing of this information is lawful, lawful and ethical. Those are the two uh, uh, words that were made. Um, and, uh, and I think there has to be a distinction uh, when we're looking at this in the context of an external inquiry, we have to make a distinction between the response of the government, sorry, this policy that was in place in government departments in the first place. That's one element of it. That's one module, if you like. And on the other hand, then it's the role of those disciplines, those professional bodies themselves that in fact did pass over these details. So the policy is one issue. But then the other issue is, in fact, the extent to which uh, ethics and uh, ethical guidelines and a, a potential breaches of the law occurred in respect of the passing over this information. Because let's not forget that uh, there was no compelability, nor could there have been, uh, on schools or professionals involved in our children's lives to hand over this information. And certainly the template letter that Joe referred to that was in the programme uh, referred very clearly to the fact that this involved children who were involved in litigation and that there was a, a, a request to hand over information and reports to those government departments in order to defend these cases and that this should be done without the knowledge and the consent of the parents and families involved. It is the first basic rule of any professional, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a doctor, or whether you're a teacher, that you comply with people's privacy rights, that you comply with confidentiality, and that you apply with their data rights. Um, and even uh, uh, from my own ethical guidelines, and those of you who have ever had any involvement with, with me will know that, when I'm seeking your files, and I'm going to show you here, this is the first basic thing that you get. You give a, a client. It's their consent form. It's the form that even authorizes me as your own lawyer to seek information on your behalf. So the idea that I would have to do this, but that solicitors or barristers or uh, case handlers on the other side can somehow have a more diluted need in terms of looking for information that your own legal team would need to have run past you first is a legal nonsense. Uh, in fact, there should be a much higher threshold, in fact, for information, of course, 
that is being sought uh, beyond what your own legal team are, are looking for. This isn't, and nor should it be, a lengthy exercise. If we're going to re-establish trust, we need to do this quickly. Neither is it going to be, uh, and I say this with a great element of positivity and optimism, neither is this an issue of having to find a needle in a haystack. We know that these are cases where, in fact, litigation took place. And what I'm at pains to emphasize to people is that what we know to date, and this is obviously subject to potentially an external inquiry, but the category of cases that this whistleblower has brought forward involved cases that had actually been taken. And so any of you who have been involved in cases will know that when you uh, take a case, you have a record number. That's a record number that is unique to your case. You will have had a, a, a solicitor on record. There will have been what we call pleadings um, and that those would have been instituted. That is how the state first knew about you in terms of this litigation. And so this isn't a needle in the haystack. Uh, issue uh, because this is information that is within very easily within the power and control of the relevant government departments to procure and to procure quickly and it shouldn't have to be although it is open to people under data protection law to request copies of their own files but I would suggest that instead of flooding the entire system with data protection requests it isn't and shouldn't be up to parents and families on top of all of the other things that they have to do to go on a fishing expedition themselves to try and assert that which they should be entitled to. And that's where the political, this, this is why this legal issue also becomes a political issue. Because if the Taoiseach's welcome commitment to follow through with what is in the best interests of children, then uh, uh, politically uh, decisions can be made and should be made very quickly that solicitors on record who are affected by this or solicitors are on record who are not affected by this should all be individually contacted uh, within a time frame. Uh, I would suggest that this is something, if we're about trust, that this should be completed within a six week period. It is not a difficult exercise to do where there is the political will to do it. And I will certainly be watching uh, uh, within the next week as to uh, uh, what a very proactive response should be. Now, that's the, that's the government's responsibility and it is the government's obligation in my view. On the other hand, there is the issue of, and this is a separate issue, but it is related. There is the issue of the breach of client confidentiality, of patient confidentiality, of privacy rights, of data rights on the part of those professionals who did a, 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 a transfer over such information. Um, there can be no hiding place, uh, and nor should there be uh, for those who have uh, engaged in this conduct. And it, if this has to be tested from a legal perspective, then parents should be given the opportunity to test it because you will have one legal opinion on one side, but where you have one legal opinion on one side, you will have another legal opinion on another. So there is no such thing as a universal legal opinion in relation to any of these uh, issues. Why is all of this important? Well, uh, and, I, and I say this as well, is that there are just some fundamental things that don't require, in fact, any written law. There are just fundamental principles of natural and constitutional justice that are inherent in all of us. Uh, in respect of the way in which we conduct uh, uh, rights-based uh, work. And can I also say that in relation to the idea that uh, national, uh, national law might have uh, allowed uh, people to do this, uh, we brought in very strong data protection laws in 2018, but going back as, as far as 1988, we have had data protection acts. And let's also not forget that the, that the strengthening of data protection laws as matters has progressed, has been based on EU requirements. And so if one is, if one, if one is making the point that we admit, well, we're, we're, we're acting in compliance with national law, then one of the things that we do need an external inquiry to look at is whether or not this practice was actually in compliance with EU law.
So um, I'm anxious to get to a point where we listen to your uh, hearings and observations. Can I just make one or two other very small points? The government has committed to working with what they call the stakeholders. There is no more important stakeholder than the parents and children involved. Uh, and I know the Ombudsman for Children had a report which came out very timely yesterday in relation to um, the voice of the child being heard in terms of uh, children uh, with a disability and additional needs. Um, can I also say that the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission also brought through a, a, an interesting and important contribution today where they talked about um, the respect for privacy that's dealt with under Article 22 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. That was ratified again in Ireland in 2018. And it says, and it's worth repeating this, that no person with disabilities, regardless of place or living arrangements, shall be, objected, shall be subjected to unlawful interference with his or her privacy, family, home or correspondence, or other types of communication, or to unlawful attacks on their honour or reputation. Persons with disabilities have the right to protection of the law against such interference or attacks. And then it goes on to say that state parties, our national governments, shall protect, shall protect the privacy of personal health and information of persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. Now, that gets me then finally to the conduct of litigation. My concern is that, first of all, all of these legal actions which are brought are unnecessary. Nobody should have to go to court to get basic, fundamental, constitutional rights to education and service provision. When we do have to go to court with those things as a last resort, a, we have to, from the top, a, lead a conversation that when those cases are, ref, are, 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 are highlighted, that we come at this not about defending proceedings, but that how do we engage with the issues that have raised? And there is a responsibility on all lawyers that when issues are raised, this shouldn't be about the mindset of defending. It should be about inquiring. And I know, for example, that there is a great emphasis now in private family law about mediation. There is no little or no mediation in law when it comes to dealing with very important issues when it comes to services for children. And when, if we do decide to go down the mediation model in relation to all of these things, the next thing is to ensure that actually everybody comes to the table with all things being on the table. I've been involved in mediation recently uh, in relation to a number of issues which, in, which involve state bodies. And my concern is that why quite often what they do is they come to the table and they say to the parent, let's discuss the color as long as you agree it's red. So we can't come to the table uh, with, with, with pre-cooked, uh, predetermined outcomes because that does not meet the paramount welfare consideration of children. And we've got to get away from seeing parents and families as obstructors, as, as the enemy, as perhaps in more extreme uh, versions. Uh, but we've got to arrive at a point where parents raising valid objections or questions or queries are not characterised as somehow this is about mad mummy in the corner. And litigation has to stop trying to uh, characterise uh, parents as the problem and instead look at solutions. So in some respects, as hurtful and as concerning and as frustrating and as annoying as it is for a lot of people, it is but another of the 110 metre hurdles that a lot of the families that I work with have had to encounter. We will overcome these issues. We will emerge from it hopefully, hopefully stronger. For many of us who work in this area, it's in fact ensuring that these things are given a wider debate and there are lessons for lawyers as well. I have seen a lot of very, uh, a lot of families very badly treated in the course of litigation. And perhaps it's time that lawyers like me in the context of litigation, highlight that to a wider public. And, uh, and so, that, so that, that, that the rules of the game uh, are, are, are everybody, is everybody on, a, on an equal playing pitch because there's no parent in this country that wants an unfair advantage for their child. They want an equal playing pitch uh, along with everybody else. So in some respects, 
I'm actually quite optimistic about where we could go with this. There is a huge opportunity for government. We have a Minister for Disabilities who's engaged and I know met with as I am today. We now have a Minister for Education with special responsibility for inclusion. A, so there is a, we, have a, we, have a, we have a dedicated Department of Children that we haven't heard a lot from in the context of this uh, last number of days. We have a massive opportunity here to not just change the rules, but change the type of engagement, the respect agenda that as I am properly highlighted. And we could emerge from this much stronger. And can I finally, finally, finally say the following. These have all involved children with autism. Be very mindful of the fact that the HAC are in fact proposing to abolish diagnosing children with autism uh, under the Disability Act through the assessment of need model instead of a, a referring children for diagnostic assessments where the red flags of autism are present. They are seeking and have sought to change that model so that in fact that becomes a service to be kicked down the road. Uh, and so if these cases involve children with autism, uh, we cannot allow a model where they seek to restrict further the rights of children by not seeking to ensure that those diagnostic assessments are done so that the right services should be put in place. Now, I know that the Oireachtas Committee on Children uh, and uh, Youth Affairs are looking at this very clearly. I know it's something that Anne Rabbit TD is very well aware of uh, and is listening is in listening mode in relation to. But it is very, very important that we just don't look at these things in a vacuum. It is vital that the assessment of need model, which the HSC have unilaterally changed in the teeth of huge opposition from their own representative organisations, from the Psychological uh, Society of Ireland, from the associations that represent OTs and speech and language therapists, start listening and start acting. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Um, that was a, 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 a very important uh, tour de force, if I may call it that, uh, uh, you know, a, a comprehensive uh, assessment of so many themes and important points which have arisen out of uh, Thursday evening's RT Investigates program. And um, there is the questions are flooding in. We have a lot of them and we have a half 